be ours, Michael Cunningham, Mrs. Dalloway. There are still flowers to buy, Clarissa feigns exasperation, though she loves doing errands like this, leaves Sally cleaning the bathroom and runs out, promising to be back in half an hour. It is New York City. It is the end of the 20th century. The vestibule door opens onto a June morning so fine and scrubbed, Clarissa pauses at the threshold as she would at the edge of a pool, watching the turquoise water lapping at the tiles. The liquid nets of sun wavering in the blue depths, as if standing at the edge of a pool, she delays for a moment the plunge, the quick membrane of chill, the plain shock of immersion. New York in its racket and stern brown decrepitude, its bottomless decline, it always produces a few summer mornings like this, mornings invaded everywhere by an assertion of new life, so determined it is almost comic, like a cartoon character that endures endless hideous punishments and always emerges unburnt, unscarred, ready for more. This June, again, the trees along West 10th Street have produced perfect little leaves from the squares of dog dirt and discarded wrappers in which they stand. Again, the window box of the old woman next door, filled as it always is with faded red plastic geraniums, pushed into the dirt has sprouted a rogue dandelion. What a thrill, what a shock, to be alive on a morning in June, prosperous, almost scandalously privileged with a simple errand to run. She, Carissa Vaughan, an ordinary person at this age, why bother trying to deny it, has flowers to buy and a party to give. As Clarissa steps down from the vestibule, her shoe makes gritty contact with the red-brown mica-studded stone of the first stair. She is 52, just 52, and in almost unnaturally good health. She feels every bit as good as she did that day in Wellfleet. At the age of 18, stepping out through the glass doors into a day very much like this one, fresh and almost painfully clear, rampant with growth, there were dragonflies zigzagging among the cattails. There was a grassy smell sharpened by pine sap. Richard came out behind her, put a hand on her shoulder and said, Why, hello, Mrs. Dalloway. The name Mrs. Dalloway had been Richard's idea, a conceit tossed off one drunken dormitory night as he assured her that Vaughn was not the proper name for her. She should, he said, be named after a great figure in literature. And while she argued for Isabel Archer or Anna Karenina, Richard had insisted that Mrs. Dalloway was the singular and obvious choice. There was a matter of existing for, of her existing first name, a sign too obvious to ignore, and more important, the larger question of fate. She, Clarissa, was clearly not destined to make a disastrous marriage or fall under the wheels of a train. She was destined to charm, to prosper. So Mrs. Dalloway, it was and would be. Isn't it beautiful? Mrs. Dalloway said that morning to Richard. He answered, beauty is a whore. I like money better. He preferred wit. Clarissa, being the youngest, the only woman, felt she could afford a certain sentimentality. If it was late June, she and Richard would have been lovers. It would have been almost a full month since Richard left Louise's bed. Luis, the farm boy fantasy, the living embodiment of lazy-eyed carnality, and came into hers. Well, I happen to like beauty, she said. She'd lifted his hand from her shoulder, bit down on the tip of his index finger, a little harder than she meant to. She was eighteen, renamed. She could do what she liked. Clarissa's shoes make their soft sandpaper sounds as she descends the stairs on her way to buy flowers. Why doesn't she feel more somber about Richard's perversely simultaneous good fortune, an anguished prophetic voice in American letters? In his decline, you have no T-cells at home, none that we can detect. What is wrong with her? She loves Richard. She thinks of him constantly, but she perhaps loves the day slightly more. She loves West 10th Street on an ordinary summer morning. She feels like a sluttish widow, freshly peroxided under her black veil. 
with her eye on the eligible men at her husband's wake. Of the three of them, Louise, Richard, Clarissa, Clarissa had always been the most hard-hearted and the one most prone to romance. She endured teasing on the subject for more than 30 years. She decided long ago to give in and enjoy her own voluptuous, undisciplined responses, which, as Richard put it, tend to be as unkind and adoring as those of a particularly irritating, precocious child. She knows that a poet like Richard would move sternly through the same morning, editing it, dismissing incidental ugliness along with incidental beauty, seeking the economic and historical truth behind these old brick townhouses, the austere stone complexions of the Episcopal Church, and the thin middle-aged man walking his Jack Russell Terrier. They are suddenly ubiquitous along Fifth Avenue, these feisty, bold-legged dogs. While she, Clarissa, simply enjoys without reason the houses, the church, the man, and the dog, it's childish, she knows. It lacks edge. If she were to express it publicly, now at her age, this love of hers would consign her to the realm of the duped and simple-minded. Christians with acoustic guitars or wives who've agreed to be harmless in exchange for their keep. Still, this indiscriminate love feels entirely serious to her, as if everything in the world is part of a vast, inscrutable intention, and everything in the world has its own secret name, a name that cannot be conveyed in language, but is simply the sight and feel of the thing itself. This determined, abiding fascination is what she thinks of as her soul, an embarrassing, sentimental word. But what else to call it? The part that might conceivably survive, the death of the body. Clarissa never speaks to anyone about any of that. She doesn't gush or chirp. She exclaims only over the obvious manifestations of beauty, and even then manages a certain aspect of adult restraint. Beauty is a whore, she t- sometimes says. I like money better. Tonight she will give her party. She will fill the rooms of her apartment with food and flowers, with people of wit and influence. She will shepherd Richard through it, see that he doesn't overtire, and then she will escort him uptown to receive his prize. She straightens her shoulders as she stands at the corner of 8th Street and 5th Avenue waiting for the light. There she is, thinks Willie Bass, who passes her some mornings just about here. The old beauty, the old hippie, hair still long and defiantly gray, out on her morning rounds in jeans and a man's cotton shirt, some sort of ethnic slippers, India, Central America, on her feet. She still has a certain sexiness, a certain bohemian good witch sort of charm, and yet this morning she makes a tragic sight, standing so straight in her big shirt and exotic shoes, resisting the pull of gravity, the the female mammoth, already up to its knees in the tar, taking a rest between efforts, standing bulky and proud, almost nonchalant, pretending to contemplate the tender grasses waiting on the far bank when it is beginning to know for certain that it will remain here, trapped and alone, after dark when the jackals come out. She waits patiently for the light. She must have been spectacular twenty-five years ago. Men must have died happy in her arms. Willie Bass is proud of his ability to discern the history of a face, to understand that those who are now old were once young. The light changes and he walks on. Clarissa crosses 8th Street. She loves helplessly the dead. Television set abandoned on the curb alongside a single white patent leather pump. She loves the vendor's cart piled with broccoli and peaches and mangoes, each labeled with an index card that offers a price amid abundances of punctuation. One forty-nine, three for one dollar, fifty cents, EA. Ahead, under the arch, an old woman in a dark, neatly tailored dress appears to be singing, stationed precisely between the twin statues of George Washington as a warrior and politician, both faces destroyed by weather. It's the city's crush and heave that move you, its irritancy, 
It's endless life. You know the story about Manhattan as a wilderness purchased for strings of beads, but you find it impossible not to believe that it has always been a city. That if you dug beneath it, you would find the ruins of another, older city, and then another, and another. Under the cement and grass of the park, she had crossed into the park now, where the old woman throws her head back and sings, lay the bones of those buried in the potter's field that was simply paved over a hundred years ago to make Washington Square. Clarissa walks over the bodies of the dead as men whispers offer of drugs, not to her, and three black girls whiz past on roller skates, and the old woman sings tunelessly, Eee! Clarissa is skittish and jubilant about her luck. Her good shoes on sale at Barney's, but still. After all this is the sturdy squalor of the park, visible even under its coat of grass and flowers. Here are the drug dealers. Would they kill you if you came to that? And the lunatics, stunned and baffled, the people whose luck if they ever had any, has run out. She still loves the world for being rude and indestructible, and she knows other people must love it too, poor as well as rich, though no one speaks specifically of the reasons. Why else do we struggle to go on living? No matter how compromised, no matter how harmed, even if we've further gone than Richard, even if we're fleshless blazing with lesions, sitting in the streets, Still, we want desperately to live. It has to do with all this, she thinks. Wheels buzzing on concrete, the royal and shock of it. Sheets of bright spray blowing the fountain as young shirtless men toss a frisbee in vendors. From Peru and Guatemala, send pungent meaty smoke up from their quilted silver carts. Old men and women straining after the sun from their benches, speaking softly to each other, shaking their heads. The bleat of car horns and strum of guitars, that ragged group over there, three boys and a girl, could they possibly be playing eight miles high? Leaves shimmering on the trees, a spotted dog chasing pigeons and a passing radio playing Always Love You as the women in the dark dress stands under the ark singing Eee. She crosses the plaza, receives a quick spatter from the fountain. And here comes Walter Hardy, muscular in shorts and a white tank top, performing his jaunty athletic stride for Washington Square Park. Hey, Claire, Walter calls jockishly. And they pass through an awkward moment about how to kiss. Walter, Walter aims his lips for caresses, and she instinctively turns her own mouth away, offering her cheek instead. Then she catches herself and turns back a half a second too late so that Walter's lips touch only the corner of her mouth. I'm so prim, Clarissa thinks, so grandmotherly. I swoon over the beauties of this world, but am reluctant, simply as a matter of reflex, to kiss a friend on the mouth. Richard told her thirty years ago that under her pirate girl veneer lay all the makings of a good suburban wife, and she is now revealed to herself as a meager spirit, too conventional, the cause of much suffering. No wonder her daughter resents her. Nice to see you, Walter says. Clarissa knows she can practically see that Walter is, at this moment, working mentally through a series of intricate calibrations regarding her personal significance. Yes, she is a woman in the book, the subject of a much-anticipated novel by an almost legendary writer, but the book failed, didn't it? It was curtly reviewed, it slipped silently beneath the waves. She is, Walter decides, like, a disposed aristocrat, interesting without being particularly important. She sees him arrive at his decision. She smiles. What are you doing in New York on a Saturday, she asks. Evan and I are staying in town this weekend, he says. He's feeling so much better on this new cocktail, he says. He wants to go dancing tonight. Isn't that a little much? I'll keep an eye on him. I won't let him overdo it. He just wants to be out in the world again. Do you think he'd feel up to coming to our place this evening? We're having a little party for Richard in honor of the Carter's prize. Oh, great. You do know about it, don't you? Sure. 
It's not some annual thing. They have no quota to fill like the Nobel and all those others. They simply award it when they become aware of someone whose career seems undeniably significant. That's great. Yes, she says. She adds after a moment. The last recipient was Ashbury. The last before him were Merrill, Rich, and Merwin. A shadow passes over Walter's broad, innocent face. Clarissa wonders, is he puzzling over the names, or could he? Could he possibly be envious? Does he imagine that he himself might be a contender for an honor like this? I'm sorry I didn't tell you about the party sooner, she says. It just never occurred to me you'd be around. You and Evan are never in town on the weekends. Walter says of course he'll come, and he'll bring Evan if Evan feels up to it, though Evan, of course, may choose to husband his energies for dancing. Richard will be furious to hear that Walter has been invited, and Sally will certainly side with him. Clarissa understands. Little in the world is less mysterious than the disdain people often feel for Walter Hardy, who's elected to turn 46 in baseball caps and Nikes who makes an obscene amount of money writing romance novels about love and loss among perfectly muscled young men who can stay out all night and dance to house music, blissful and inexhaustible as a German shepherd retrieving a sick UC men like Walter all over Chelsea in the village, men who insist a 30 or 40 or older that they have always been chipper and confident, powerful of body, that they've never been strange children, never taunted or despised. Richard argues that eternally youthful gay men do more harm than cause than do men who seduce little boys. And yes, it's true that Walter brings no shadow of adult irony or cynicism. Nothing remotely profound, his interest in fame and fashions, the latest restaurant. Yet it is this greedy innocent Clarissa appreciates. Don't we love children in part because they live outside the realm of cynicism and irony? Is it so terrible for a man to want more youth, more pleasure? Besides, Walter is not corrupt. Not exactly corrupt. He writes the best books he can. Books full of romance and sacrifice, courage in the face of adversity, and surely they must offer real comfort to any number of people. His name appears constantly on invitations to fundraisers and on letters of protest. He writes embarrassingly lavish blurbs for younger writers. He takes good, faithful care of Evan. These days, Clarissa believes you measure people first by their kindness and their capacity for devotion. You get tired sometimes of wit and intellect. Everybody's display little of genius, and she refuses to stop enjoying Walter Hardy's shameless shallowness, even if it drives Sally to distraction, and has actually inspired Richard to wonder out loud if she, Clarissa, isn't more than a little vain and foolish herself. Good, Clarissa says. You know where we live, right? Five o'clock? Five o'clock. It needs to be early. The ceremony's at eight, and we're having the party before instead of after. Richard can't manage late nights. Right. Five o'clock. See you then. Walter squeezes Clarissa's hand and walks on with a swaggering two-step, a demonstration of hefty vitality. It's a cruel joke of a sort, inviting Walter to Richard's party. But Walter, after all, is alive, just as Clarissa is on a morning in June. And he'll feel horribly snubbed if he finds out, and he seems to find everything out. Clarissa spoke to him the day of the party and deliberately failed to mention it. Wind worries the leaves, showing the brighter, let grayer green of the undersides. And Clarissa wishes, suddenly and with a surprising urgency, that Richard here, beside her, right now, not Richard as he's become, but the Richard of ten years ago. Richard the fearless, ceaseless talker. Richard the gaffly. She wants the argument. She wants that Richard would had had about Walter. Before Richard's decline, Clarissa always fought with him. Richard always worried over questions of good and evil, and he never, not in twenty years, fully abandoned the notion that Clarissa's decision to live with Sally represents, if not some work day manifestation of deep corruption, at least a weakness on her part that indicts, though Richard would never admit this, women in general, since he seems to have decided early on that Clarissa stands not for herself, but for the gifts and frailties of her entire sex. Richard has always been Clarissa's more rigorous, infuriating companion, 
and her best friend, and if Richard were still himself untouched by illness, they could be together and right now, arguing about Walter Hardy and the quest for eternal youth, about how gay men have taken to Im imitating the boys who tortured them in high school. The old Richard would be capable for of talking half an hour more than the various possible interpretations of the inept copy of Botticelli's Venus being drawn by a young black man with chalk on the concrete, and if that Richard had noticed the wind-blown plastic bag that billowed against the white sky, rippling like a jellyfish, he'd have carried on about chemicals and endless profits. The hand that takes, he'd have wanted to talk about how the bag, say it had contained potato chips and overripe bananas, say it had been thoughtlessly discarded by a harassed, indig indignant mother as she left a store amid her gaggle of quarreling children will blow into the Hudson and float all the way to the ocean where eventually a sea turtle, a creature that could live a hundred years, will mistake it for a jellyfish, eat the bag, and die. It wouldn't have been impossible for Richard to segue somehow from that subject directly to Sally, to inquire after her health and happiness with pointed formality. He had a habit of asking about Sally after one of his tirades, as if Sally were some sort of utterly banal safe haven, as if Sally herself, Sally the stoic, the tortured, the subtly wise, were harmless and insipid in the way of a house on a quiet street or a good, solid, reliable car. Richard will never admit to nor from his nor recover from his dislike of her. Never. He will never discard his private conviction that Clarissa has at heart become a society wife. Never mind the fact that she and Sally do not attempt to disguise their love for anyone's sake, or that Sally is a devoted, intelligent woman, a producer of public television for heaven's sake. How much of hard-working and socially responsible, how much dramatically underpaid does she need to be? Never mind the good, flagrantly unprofitable books Clarissa insists on publishing alongside the pulpier items that pay her way. Never mind her politics or the work with PWAs. Clarissa crosses Houston Street and thinks that she might pick up a little something for Evan to acknowledge his tentatively returning health, not flowers. The flowers are subtly wrong for the deceased, they're disastrous for the ill. But what? The shops of Soho are full of party dresses and jewellery and Biedermeyer, nothing to take an imperious, clever young man who might or might not, with the help of battery of drugs, live out his normal span. What does anyone want? Clarissa passes a shop and thinks of buying a dress for Julia. She'd look stunning in that little black one with the Anna Magnani straps, but Julia doesn't wear dresses. She insists on spending her youth, the brief period in which one can wear anything at all, stomping around in men's undershirts and leather lace-ups the size of cinder blocks. Why does her daughter tell her so little? What happened to the ring Clarissa gave her for her 18th birthday? Here's that good little bookstore on Spring Street. Maybe Evan would like a book. Displayed in the window is one, only one, of Clarissa's. The English one. Criminal how she'd had to battle for a printing of 10,000 copies, and worse, how it looks as if they'll all be lucky to sell five alongside the South American family saga she lost to a bigger house, which will clearly fail to earn out, because, for mysterious reasons, it is respected but not loved. There's a new biography of Robert Mapplethorpe, and the poems of Louis Gluck, but nothing seems right. They are all at once too general and too specific. You want to give him the book of his own life, the book that will lo hmm, parent him, arm him for the changes. You can't show up with celebrity gossip, can you? You can't bring the story of an embittered English novelist or the fates of seven sisters in Chile. However beautifully written, and Evan is about as likely to read poetry as he is to take up painting on china plates. There is no comfort, it seems, in the world of objects, and Clarissa feel, fears that art, even the greatest of it, even Richard's three volumes of poetry and his single unreadable novel, belongs stubbornly to the world of objects. Standing in front of the bookstore window, she visited by an old memory, a tree branch tapping against a window as from somewhere else. Downstairs? Faint music, the low moan of a jazz band started up on a phonograph. It is not her first memory that seems to involve a snail crawling over the lip of a curb, or even her second, her mother's straw sandals, or maybe the two that are reversed. But this memory, more than any other, feels urgent and deeply, almost supernaturally comforting. 
Clarissa would have been in a house in Wisconsin, probably one of the many her parents rented during the summers, rarely the same one twice. Each proved to have some defect for her mother's to stitch into her ongoing narrative. The Vaughn family's trail of tears tore the Wisconsin dells. Clarissa would have been three or four in a house to which she would never return, about which she retains no recollection except this utterly distinct, clearer than some things that happened yesterday, a branch tapping at a window as the sound of horns began, as if the tree began unsettled by the wind had somehow caused the music. It seemed that at this moment she began to inhabit the world, to understand that the promise is implied by an order larger than human happiness, though it contained human happiness along with every other emotion. The branch and the music matter more to her than do all the books in the store window. She wants for Evan and she wants for herself a book that can carry what that singular memory carries. She stands looking at the books and at her reflection superimposed on the glass. She still looks at the all right, handsome now instead of pretty. When will the crepe and gauntness, the shriveled lips of her old woman's face begin to emerge? And then she walks on regretting the lovely little black dress she can't buy for her daughter because Julia is in the thrall to a queer theorist and insists on t-shirts and combat boots. You respect Mary Kroll. She gives you no choice living, as she does on the verge of poverty, going to jail for various causes, lecturing passionately at NYU about the sorry masquerade known as gender. You want to like her. You struggle to, but she is finally too despotic in her intellectual and moral intensity, her endless demonstration of cutting-edge leather-jacketed righteousness. You know she mocks you privately for your comforts and your quaint, she must consider them quaint, notions about lesbian identity. You grow weary of being treated as the enemy simply because you are not young anymore, because you dress unexceptionally. You want to scream at Mary Kroll and that it doesn't make much difference. You want her to come inside your head for a few days and feel the worries and sorrows, the nameless fear. You believe, you know that you and Mary Kroll suffer from the same mortal sickness, the same queasiness of soul, and with one more turn, the dial, you might have been friends, but it is as... It's she's come to claim your daughter and sit you in a comfortable apartment, hating her as much as any Republican father would. Clarissa's father, gentle almost to the point of translucence, loved seeing women in little black dresses. Her father grew exhausted. He gave up his cognancy the way he often gave up arguments, simply because it was easier to agree. Up ahead on MacDougall, a company is shooting a movie amid the usual welter of trailers and equipment trucks. The banks of white lights, here is the ordinary world, a movie being shot, a Puerto Rican boy cranking open the awning of a restaurant with a silver pole, here is the world and you live in it, and are grateful, you try to be grateful. She pushes open the florist door, which always sticks slightly and walks in, a tall woman, broad-shouldered amid the bunches of roses and hyacinths. The mossy flats of paper whites, the orchids trembling on their stalks. Barbara, who has worked in the shop for years, says hello. After a pause, she offers her cheek for a kiss. Hello, Clarissa says. Her lips touch Barbara's skin, and the moment is suddenly, unexpectedly perfect. She stands in the dim, deliciously cool little shop that is like a temple, solemn in its abundance. Its bunches of dried flowers hanging from the ceiling, and its rack of ribbons trailing against the back wall. There was that branch tapping the window pane, and there was another, though she'd been older, five or six, in her own bedroom. This branch covered with red leaves, and she can remember thinking back reverently, even then, to that earlier branch, the one that had seemed to excite the music downstairs. She remembers loving the autumn branch for reminding her of the earlier branch tapping against the window of a house to which she would never return, which she could not otherwise remember in any of its particulars. Now she is here, in the flower shop, where poppies drift white and apricot on long, hairy stems. Her mother, who kept a tin of snowy French mint in her purse, pursed her lips and called Clarissa a crazy, a crazy girl, in a tone of flirtatious admiration. How are you? Barbara asks. Fine, just fine, she says. We're having a little party tonight for a friend who's just won a big deal literary award. The Pulitzer? No, it's called the Carthur's Prize. 
Barbara offers a blank expression that Clarissa understands is meant as a smile. Barbara is 40 or so, a pale, ample woman who came to New York to sing opera. Something about her face, the square jar, the stern, inexpressive eyes reminds you that people look essentially the same a hundred years ago. We're a little slow right now, she says. There have been about fifty weddings this week. I don't need much, Clarissa says. Just a few bunches of something or other. Clarissa feels inexplicably guilty about not being a better friend to Barbara, though they know each other only as customer and saleswoman. Clarissa buys all her flowers from Barbara and sent her a card years ago when she learned of her breast cancer scare. Barbara's career has not gone as planned. She lives somehow on her hourly wages, a tenement, probably, with the bathtub in the kitchen. And she has escaped cancer, this time. For a moment, Mary Kroll hovers over the lilies and roses, preparing to be appalled at what Clarissa will spend. We've got some beautiful hydrangeas, Barbara says. Let's see. Clarissa goes to the cooler and chooses flowers, which Barbara pulls from their containers and holds, dripping in her arms. In the 19th century, she'd have been a country wife, gentle and unremarkable, dissatisfied, standing in a garden. Clarissa chooses peonies and stargazer lilies, cream-colored roses, does not want the hydrangeas. Guilt. Guilt, it looks like he will never outgrow it. And is considering irises. Are irises somehow a little outdated? when a huge shattering sound comes from the street outside. What was that? Barbara says. She and Clarissa go to the window. I think it's the movie people. Probably. They've been filming out there all morning. Do you know what it is? No. She says and turned away from the window with a certain elderly rectitude, holding her arm full of flour just as the ghost of her earlier self a hundred years ago would have turned up from the rattle and creak of the carriage passing by, full of perfectly dressed picnickers from a distant city. Clarissa remains, looking out at the welter of trucks and trailers. Suddenly, the door to one of the trailers opens, and a famous head emerges. It's a woman's head, quite a distance away, seen in profile, like the head on a coin. And while Clarissa cannot immediately identify her, Meryl Streep, Vanessa Redgrave, she knows without question that the woman is a movie star. She knows by her aura of regal assurance and by the eagerness with which one of the prop men speaks to her, inaudibly to Clarissa, about the source of the noise. The woman's head quickly withdraws and the door to the trailer closes again, but she leaves behind her an unmistakable sense of watchful remonstrance, as if an angel had briefly touched the surface of the world with one scalded foot, asked if there was any trouble and being told all was well, had resumed her place in the earlier, in the other with sceptical gravity, having reminded of the children of the earth that they're just barely trusted to manage their own business, and that further carelessness will not go unremarked.